Now, down in Washington, Special Counsel Jack Smith also is pushing for a gag order on Trump. I mentioned that even though these are completely separate cases, how they work, the rulings, the resolution are completely separate jurisdictions. One is the state system and civil, the other is the federal system and criminal. But if you've heard about gag orders and are wondering, okay, why so many gag orders? Well, what all these cases have in common, and sometimes the news is simple, sometimes the truth is simple. What all these cases have in common in this instance is the defendant. And the civil defendant who was just gagged in New York today also faces calls to gag him in the federal case, where Jack Smith is arguing that a targeted, a, what we would call a partial gag order, is necessary to protect witnesses and other people in that case. So we are still awaiting a decision in that case where that issue went all the way up to the D.C. Court of Appeals. Now, things are not looking very promising for Donald Trump there for a variety of reasons. In the special counsel case, moving beyond the gag orders to the trial he actually faces in March, well, there are outlets reporting one of Trump's lawyers testified to the special counsel. She told him that it would be a crime to resist complying with the subpoena for the Mar-a-Lago documents. Jack Smith overseeing both Trump federal cases. That's the documents espionage case and the coup case that we've been talking about more recently, and that is, of course, scheduled for an earlier trial. Now, NBC News has not confirmed the reports you see on your screen from The Times and ABC there, but they are damning the lawyer reportedly telling Trump very clearly it's going to be a crime if Trump refuses to comply, and that Trump, quote, absolutely understood the warning. There was also the advice, advice of counsel, you may have heard that term, quote, you've got to comply. Now, when we show you this quote and this type of evidence, the reason this is bad for Trump is that sometimes you can argue that you were confused or that you were so confused that you didn't evince, you didn't have the level of criminal intent required to prove that you should go to jail for a crime, for breaking the law. We have our experts on, our lawyers on, and others who talk about those elements. Sometimes people say, gosh, Ari, it seems frustrating. Why is it so hard to prove? Why does it take so long, etc.? Well, the reason is this ain't a parking ticket. In the United States, when the rules are enforced correctly, the defendants not only have rights, but they have all of the benefits of the burden being on the government. The government has to prove not only that you did it, but that you intended to do it, that you meant to do it, that it wasn't just some mistake or blunder or even car accident. A car accident where people die is a tragedy, but it's not a murder unless the government can prove that you set out to use your car to take a life. And misplaced documents aren't usually always convicted as espionage-related crimes unless you really set out to do that. And so that evidence is really bad for Trump if a jury's going to hear that not only did he do it, because there's literally no factual debate about the documents, they found him. You've seen him on TV. But not only did he mean to do it, but he was warned doing it would be a crime, and he went forward anyway. That adds the evidence of criminal intent. As for the advice of counsel defense, that's the related issue where maybe you are able to find some lawyer or some memo where you say, I thought I was doing what they wanted. I was trying to follow the rules. Well, there's someone who knows a lot about that type of defense and how Donald Trump may allegedly misuse it. Take a listen. Donald cares for no one or anything other than himself. He will now start blaming things on the lawyers. Well, the lawyers told me to do it. Quite frankly, the lawyers told me. I'm not a lawyer. That's what I hired them for. And he's going to throw them under the bus, and they know it, and that's why they're all out there protecting themselves. Michael Cohen there speaking to our colleague Katie Fang on MSNBC on this program, and he's referring to something he lived through. He even did a bid partially for convicted crimes on behalf of Trump, partially for other things that basically he pled out to for his own behalf. But altogether, he's talking about what Trump does as a client. There are also new details about the coup efforts, because we've talked about all the different ways you get evidence. Liz Cheney's books made waves, Jan Six committee, but then you have all of these other ways that some of this evidence has been held. And so texts from Republican Congressman Scott Perry have now become public revealing that he had this vast web of contacts that he was talking to, these different contacts where they were discussing how they might overturn or seal the election. And it included really a who's who of the Republican Party, people like Ronna McDaniel, Mark Meadows, some of these names you recognize, White House Counsel's Office, the Director of National Intelligence, that's a pretty serious position with security clearances and national security powers, the Trump campaign lawyers, and, and this is an interesting one you see on the upper middle right there, Trump official Jeffrey Clark. Well, that name is familiar because it ties a link from the Justice Department to the Republican Congress to Donald Trump's 
alleged conspiracy because Mr. Clark is an unindicted co-conspirator in Jack Smith's coup case. And when we take this all together, we've shown you some of these individuals have already pled out. They are guilty. They are convicts. And we can show you here on the screen, you'll look at basically you have some from the Washington case and the Georgia case. And you see Clark in the lower right, a co-conspirator in the DOJ case, now tied to this Republican congressman. At the time, nobody knew in public there wasn't even a single article about that level of advanced plotting. Mr. Clark, as you can see in the yellow lower right, has been indicted in Georgia for that stuff. Legally, he's presumed innocent, but there's a ton of evidence that prosecutors say means they can convict him. And if you scan your eyes over, you'll see people like Miss Ellis, who was already convicted in Georgia and who's pledged to, pro to uh, cooperate with prosecutors. So all of this together shows that rising heat. And now take a look at how some of this fits in. Was it your understanding that Representative Kerry was pushing for a specific person to take over the department? He wanted Mr. Clark, Mr. Jeff Clark, to take over the Department of Justice. He said uh, something to the effect of, uh, I think Jeff Clark is great, and I think he's the kind of guy who could get in there and do something about this stuff. The kind of guy who could do something about this stuff has to be translated to one of the few people working inside the Justice Department who would actually partner up with the outgoing losing candidate, Donald Trump, to try to overthrow President-elect Biden. That's what Jeffrey Clark was. And let, look, I've said this before. Donald Trump's not running for a second term. He's running for a life term. These are the type of people, some of whom are indicted, some of whom are convicted, that would come into power in a second term. This is exactly what he wanted to do when he thought he was losing power. He's going to continue, and he said in public, he's going to use the DOJ. He said it in the last week or two. We're not running every soundbite of everything Donald Trump says as a candidate, but... This is all going to be public for people to consider as they cast their votes next year. These are the people he wants in charge. He's at publicly identified the DOJ as the place he wants to do it, to punitively, potentially illegally go after his critics, opponents, enemies. It's a playbook from other countries, but it's also a playbook from Donald Trump's failed coup. Now, Clark went through Perry to try to get access to more sensitive intelligence about election results than he had access to as a DOJ official, telling Perry, quote, Tell the president, the CIA chief, quote, needs to get me these security clearance tickets. Perry replies, referring to then outgoing President Trump, POTUS is giving you a presidential security clearance. So you got to ask yourself, as we learn more and more and more about this, why do you need all these cutouts and intermediaries? Why would someone in the executive branch, Mr. Clark, who, as I mentioned, is now indicted in state court and an unindicted co-conspirator by the DOJ where he once worked, why does he need to go to a different branch, the legislative branch, to then connect back up to the person who, for a few days at least, left was still the head of the executive branch, Donald Trump? It's not normal. It's secretive. It's suspicious. And while the answer is complicated, it may shed light on why so many people are worried about going to jail for this coup. Would it be the normal process uh, to go from executive to Congress to back to executive to get emergency security clearance like this? And if not, um, what might that tell you with an investigative lens uh, as you look at all of this? Well, of course, it's not at all uh, commonplace. Uh, and it's also not commonplace to be doing this with respect to somebody who was in the civil division, and prior to that, it was the head of the environmental division. It had nothing to do um, with the Department of Justice looking at potential voter fraud. That's that's not his purview, um, as has been very very clear. So this is really because they they wanted Jeff Clark to issue a letter that was false on the part of the Department of Justice, saying they were looking at fraud allegations. And in fact, um, the D.C. indictment refers to um, Jeff Clark going further than that and saying, drafting a memo that's saying that he actually found indications of fraud. It reminds me very much of what the foreign president did with um, Zelensky. He wanted a foreign country to say that they were investigating his political rival. So it's to me, it's exactly of a piece, which is using a trumped up uh, claim of 
a you know, prosecutor looking into wrongdoing to say, ah, see, there's wrongdoing there with respect to either the election or to a political adversary. Um, but it, to me, it also goes to the idea that we now have not just information from Senator Grassley being complicit. We now have information, as you referred to, with respect to Senator Perry being complicit. Um, and these these are the key people who enable what Donald Trump is doing. Um, and it's sort of shocking that they're sitting members of Congress. Yeah, as you say, part of the the one branch that's supposed to be the most concerned, at least as the founders saw it, with direct democracy. Um, and yet there they are undermining it. And that's that's the sort of one of the, the points right. that lets you know we're in the breach. Uh, as you know, Andrew, a lot of legal issues are complicated. Some are not. Uh, I don't know if you'll agree with, and it's fine if you don't. Uh, my legal reporting, that the only thing connecting the gag orders in New York and D.C. is the defendant. Otherwise, they're quite different cases, and they'll go different ways. Um, but what does that tell you, and what do you see in the even more significant question of whether Jack Smith will win the, the partial gag order he wants against Trump going into March? Well, they, they are different um, uh, other than the, the defendant, obviously. Um, it just, it's notable, the one in New York, it's a civil case, and it is the mildest of gag orders. It literally was do not denigrate and cause potential harm for the staff of the court. I mean, it, like you shouldn't even have to be told that. It's so obvious that that is a rule. Um, I also think with respect to a criminal case, um, I know this sounds like I'm a real pedant, and it's probably true, but I don't really think of it as a gag order. I think of it as a restriction um, that's part of his bail conditions. He's a defendant out yep. on bail, pending trial. And it is true that it does gag what he can say. But you know what else is restricted? His Second Amendment rights. The spiraling of billionaire Elon Musk as he continues to find out that the way he's running Twitter, which he asked people to call X, is not going anything like he or his right-wing fans thought it would. Musk has a backlash here over many issues. Most recently, the way he used his platform and his huge following to support a blatantly anti-Semitic post online. The White House doesn't weigh in on most tweets, but they went out of their way to condemn Elon Musk for what they viewed as him basically fanning anti-Semitism during this very tense time in the world. Advertisers have been fleeing the company even more often lately, to the tune of $75 million in lost revenue, some of that attributable directly to how Elon Musk uses the platform. Now, there were actual shock, actual gasps, and actual kind of outrage, if that's such a thing you can muster, at a meeting of sort of business elites and others, because Elon Musk, as he likes to do to get attention, sat down with a New York Times reporter. You can see some of the footage here. And when pressed on very basic questions about some of what I just mentioned, including the way advertisers who, again, in a free market, decide what to do with their ad dollars, that's what people like Mr. Musk and other business folks say is the good thing about free market economics, well, he doesn't like it if it means that they aren't advertising with his company. So here is The Times' Andrew Ross Sorkin, who also works at CNBC, which is a sister channel we should mention. And here is The Angry Billionaire. There was all of the criticism. There was advertisers leaving. We talked to Bob Iger today. I hope today. they stop. You hope? Uh, don't advertise. If somebody's going to try to blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go f*** yourself. Go yourself. Is that clear? This is the one part of your business where you will be beholden to those who uh, have this view. G what do you do? F Y. Now that is a telling moment. First of all, Elon Musk is very smart. When he tries to lie to you and tell you that regular business activity is blackmail, he is playing a trick. He's hoping not the people in the room, but everyone else will be fooled by that. Blackmail is an actual thing. It is a legal concept, and it has a definition. 
and it doesn't refer to people deciding where to spend their money or whether or not to spend their money. It refers to illegally leveraging something over someone. That is not what these advertisers are doing. Now, keep in mind, we didn't just show you this for the F-bomb value. That room that he's talking in is full of those advertisers. So he very clearly hurt himself and the company, and he has a lot of investors that he's still answerable to by blatantly acting that way. There's also the issue that while Musk talked about free speech, he has been cracking down on free speech at the, on the platform. If you watch the beat, you may recall we reported this out months ago when he was first taking over. And the point we made then is the same we will make now. We couldn't see the future. We could see the past. Elon Musk has no record of free speech advocacy. It was another one of the things he said to the outside public to try to win people over. And he also used it to try to argue that right wing forces in certain places, including America, must be protected by a free speech referee because they somehow, in their telling of it, are being censored more than others. Now, true free speech means free speech for everyone, and people with right-wing views should not be discriminated against. But Elon Musk has not been a free speech advocate. He's cracked down for it on the platform. Now, at this same summit, Musk was also pressed on reports that Twitter is limiting users' access to New York Times articles. Again, that would be a free speech issue. Critics have described it as an attack on the free press. Any organization that refuses to buy a subscription uh, is, is, is not going to be recommended. But then what does that say about free speech? And what does well, that say about like a, amplifying free certain, is not certain exactly voices? Free. It costs a little bit. Right, but the- <laughs> <laughs> South Park, uh, right. when they say, you know, freedom isn't free, it costs a buck or five or whatever. Um, um, so, but it's pretty cheap, okay? Um, it's low cost, low cost freedom. Notice the obvious hypocrisy stacked right against each other in these two clips we showed you. If advertisers decide that they don't want to put their money into something where their ads will be up against, say, anti Semitic posts or racist material or other problems, he accuses them of blackmail. But if long standing, proven journalistic outlets like The Times, don't buy things from Twitter, then they won't be verified, which used to and technically literally still means that there's a verification for who you are. He wants to have it both ways. As for his spiraling and his money losing, well, all of this is a reaction to how poorly it's going. Elon Musk is many things, but a perfect actor he is not. And you can tell from the freak out that he's not happy. He doesn't sound like a happy person. He doesn't sound like he's winning. And it's the opposite of what conservatives had hoped would happen when he took over. For once, this isn't about power and money. Musk is doing it to save free speech. It's not an overstatement to say it could be the single most important development for free speech in the modern history of the United States. This is a guy who's who's made a lot of money, he's been very successful, loves this country and the freedoms it affords. The first thing he's gonna do is establish free speech there. We turn now to a guest who actually called much of this in some of our earlier discussions. It's a special day on the beat called Che Day. And Obama veteran political strategist Che Komanduri is here. Uh, Welcome back, Che. When you see uh, Elon Musk, good to have you. When you see him in that setting, that angry, um, that much double talk, what does it tell you? It tells me that he knows he's losing. He's losing his influence on this platform. He is losing potentially billions of dollars. I think that the stock of Twitter has just absolutely uh, plummeted under his under under him. And I think he also knows that he has made a series of very bad bets. Specifically, he has kind of made the same exact bet that Ron DeSantis made and is also seeing Ron and Ron DeSantis is also seeing his fortunes plummet, which is they bet that MAGA was the future for Elon Mm. Musk. That meant going full in on MAGA conspiracy theories. You know, uh, he talked about the Paul Pelosi conspiracy theory, the Texas mall shooter conspiracy theory, Hunter Biden conspiracy theories, you name it. Any MAGA conspiracy theory he amplified on the site. He thought that was a path to riches, to power, to control, to the future. DeSantis did the same thing. He kind of thought that all the woke stuff uh, would be something that would deliver him the nomination. He is going absolutely nowhere. And I think they made the same mistake. And I think it's interesting to think about like an alternative world 
where they went in the opposite, both of them had, would, would have gone in the opposite direction.